Welcome to Series 2 of the GM Moving Podcast, where we share with you stories of how people and partners across Greater Manchester are creating the conditions for active lives for all. I'm Eve, Strategic Director at Greater Sport, leading, supporting and connecting GM Moving, Greater Manchester's movement for movement. Supported by investment from Sport England, Greater Manchester partners have been taking a whole system, place-based approach to embed physical activity into everything, to enable sustained behaviour change for happier, healthier, more connected communities and active lives for all. In each episode, we share stories of what this looks like in action in each of the 10 boroughs of Greater Manchester. Today, I'm back in Manchester Central Library with Annette, local pilot lead in Tameside, and I'm rejoined by Nicole, one of my colleagues at Greater Sport, who supports the local pilot network. Tameside is home to over 200,000 people. The latest Active Lives results published by Sport England show that over 67% of adults in Tameside are active for at least 30 minutes a week. However, the data suggests that disabled residents in Tameside and people over 75 are more likely to be inactive than in other parts of GM. You can find out more about the data and insight on the GM Moving website. Tameside's local pilot takes a a wide approach with particular focus on working with young people and families, people out of work and people in work but at risk of worklessness and people aged 40 to 60 with or at risk of long-term health conditions. So let's join Annette and Nicole to hear how they've been supporting a systemic approach to physical activity in Tameside to include designing moving into spaces and places to create more active and healthy environments for children, young people and families. Welcome, I've got Annette here from Tameside and Nicole's back um, from Greater Manchester. So I'm going to start with you, Annette. Hello. Hi. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Good to have you both here. Starting with you, Annette, a little bit about your story, really. So why moving matters to you personally and what's led you to this point? I was thinking about this last night and I was kind of wondering to myself, why did I end up here? (laughs) (laughs) Thinking back to kind of my relationship with physical activity growing up, I've always been active, but I've um, not always been active in the way that kind of like kids were supposed to be active. So when it came to like school, PE, contact sports, all that stuff, that was like times of horror for me. I really hated it. <laughs> Outside of that, I did a lot of dancing, um, like ballet tap and modern, like a lot of, you know, young girls do. And I really enjoyed it. And where I felt like I was really kind of rubbish at school sports, I excelled in that. So I sc- I've scored like one rounder in my whole life. Um, <laughs> it was a really bad moment. Like, I, like <laughs> I know, everybody knows it. Um, it's a proud moment. But yeah, but in, in kind of ballet, I was getting like commended and highly commended. And it was the kind of the dance to music that always kind of inspired me. As I grew up, that kind of morphed into other things. So like in my teenage years, I did like 80s aerobics and, you know, the whole like leotards and everything. Excellent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was not a pretty sight. I kind of found my way back to that a bit more recently. I realised that the reward for physical activity to me is kind of like extrinsic. It's the music that keeps me kind of moving. Um, so, you know, joining gym classes, step classes, all that kind of stuff. That's kind of what I really enjoyed. And then things change, life circumstances change, children come um, and you don't get the chance to do that. So you have to find it kind of anywhere else. So cycling, hiking, but it's all kind of social. It's all time, you know, quality time spent with friends and family moving. Um, So it's kind of the stuff that keeps me sane, really. Sounds good. So do you still get to dance somewhere, ever? Sometimes in the kitchen when no one's around. Not as much as I would like to. I did did take it up for a little while. I did... um, there's a um, like a 1940s dance troupe near us called the Backstep Boogie Club. They were really good. We had them at our engagement party, so we all dressed up in 1940s oh, clothing. Like fun. It was really good fun until I realised that my husband's actually terrified of dancing, <laughs> but he didn't tell me that until we were already having the party. And I noticed him kind of nervously sweating in the corner. I was like, what's wrong? He was like, I can't dance. Please don't make me dance. Like, you probably could have mentioned that about six months ago when we started planning that, but, but he didn't. But I had a great time. It was really good fun. I'm seeing a future local pilot forum session on the dance floor. Well, I was just thinking, I'm sure there's some space here. And if you want to do some interpretive dance, I can always put it on Twitter. It's quite a small space, to be fair, in this podcast studio. But anyway, any space will do. I need somebody to lead. I'm a follower when it comes to dancing. No, not me. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> 
always happy to lead dancing. Well, it fits us. They were always talking about stepping aside, stepping back, stepping to, <laughs> stepping forward. <laughs> it's a constant dance in this work. <laughs> so tell us a little bit then about your role now in Tameside. Um, so I've been the local pilot lead I don't know, it feels like after the ages. Um, yeah, it feels like forever. It's got to be at least three, coming up for four years. Oh, yeah, 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 it's, about, yeah. it's about three and a half years. Yeah. yeah, I'm kind of the strategic lead, so we, we work with a kind of a collaboration. So we've got the Active Alliance, which is our cross-sector partnership. So there's myself, there's um, kind of Green Space, there's Active Tame Side of our sport and leisure provider, the School Sports Partnership... Um, Action Together Action Together yeah so there's there's quite a few of us and we kind of we originally kind of set the direction for the local pilot and now I guess it's kind of my job to try and make sure we keep going on those trajectories and to keep convening the spaces for people to get back together to talk about it and to try and make sure that we're linking in the right people partners and Mm -hmm. keeping on building the network so Nicole Mm -hmm. just um, let uh, listeners know what your role is and what are you doing here today I am the local pilot network lead for greater sport and I am the relationship builder for Tameside so I work quite closely with Annette in terms of um, supporting her with the local pilot yeah I mean Annette probably you know is of the opinion that I peck ahead a bit Um, (laughs) um, what I've enjoyed is that there's there's been lots of different people around the table as well it's not the usual suspects you know you kind of expect some people to be there but there's there's a wider remit as well which is which really really good to see great i think nicole's key role is to like reassure me that things are still okay the way they're going (laughs) which probably that conversation probably takes person at least once a month of like is it okay am i doing it right And you're, do, you're doing it very well. <laughs> Thanks, like to say, you're, you're say in this that. public forum. <laughs> you're doing a great job. I suspect relationship building is going to be a bit of a theme through this, but so far, yeah, so reassurance mm-hmm. <laughs> and head pecking, mm-hmm. um, which of course was the start of GM moving, was, um, was Yvonne pecking the head of Stephen Pleasant. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's a common theme that is critical to making change, apparently. So, we're in Tameside at the moment in terms of local pilot. Have you got a particular theme in terms of a target audience or locality? This is probably one of the biggest questions that I keep throwing back. Are we doing it right? Because um, I think out of all the localities, we kind of took a slightly different approach. Maybe I took the systemic approach a bit too literally um, in comparison to other areas because a lot of other areas kind of picked a one, maybe two kind of focused target areas and really kind of ploughed everything into those areas whereas we kind of went well if it's systemic change the system's everywhere so when we originally sat down to have the conversations to say you know which target audience we kind of ended up going well all of them and then when we said well where is it well it's everywhere and then kind of went are we spreading ourselves too thin late mm, maybe we don't we don't have kind of a, fo- a focus area it's it's tame side wide obviously we look at the kind of the places with the most need first so we look at our kind of most deprived wards or we look where there are pockets of communities that are kind of underrepresented in physical activity and we try and kind of do stuff there first or we try to have the conversations there first and whenever there's an opportunity you know if it's a joint um, like bid or fund or something like that we try and see where the best opportunity is to kind of direct things so we're kind of like <laughs> omnipresent at the moment it feels like which actually yes we are spreading ourselves quite thinly so now it feels like we're at a bit of a cusp of change where actually we need to kind of nail our colours to a few particular masts because now post-covid we are looking at kind of more delivery um, less less theory more delivery um, and that by its very nature has to take place in a space so that's kind of where we're heading now i was thinking debbie sorkin when she talks about systems changes and she talks about we'll start somewhere go everywhere <laughs> That's pretty much so. what we're doing. <laughs> so there you go, Debbie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then maybe you go everywhere and then you come back to somewhere to, to take action. To yeah, action. that kind of feels like... Sense making and then yeah. you go, okay, where next? Where are we going to focus? So it's a particular phase that you're at as well, really, mm-hmm. in the pilot. So in all of that, in being everywhere, um, what have been some of the key kind of joys so far? Some of the work that we've been doing with children in out-of-school settings, I mean, by its very nature, it's lovely to see kids kind of getting active and getting enthusiastic about things. So pre-COVID, it was like the last thing we did pre-COVID was test out a story walk. Um, we got our inspiration from Oldham. We stole their ideas. <laughs> um, so they gave us they um, gave us some great ideas and some great tips and advice, and we tested it out, and we got kind of like three hundred kids out in the in Christmas week, 
I mean, we did promise Santa, so you know, it's a bit, <laughs> a bit of bribery. Um, it's but, a good tip. <laughs> yeah, it was. Book Santa early. He gets booked up very early. Busy man that time of year. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that went really well. And what's really lovely is that during COVID, we kind of had self-led trails. So we still tried to kind of carry that forward. We had a, an audio Halloween trail with like potion making and things. But now we're in a position where we can get back out there again. So we had, it's actually, it's happening this week. I think it was Monday of this week. We had a story walk. So we had Where the Wild Things Are. Um, we buddied up with Transport for Greater Manchester um, and the activation funding. And we had a local storyteller uh, called uh, Simon, who is just brilliant. And he's got a really kind of dedicated following from like mums and dads from, you know, young, young families. So we had 60 school kids come out with the little Where the Wild Things masks on and there was a Where the Wild Things thing in the woods and they had a wild rumpus and there was bubbles and music and it was just, it was really lovely. And this was in Chadwick Dam, which is um, kind of a newly refurbished space for want of a, a better word. So Mayor's Challenge Fund. So it's got the cycling and walking kind of network there, but actually there's been a lot of greening. There's a sensory garden. We've got a very rare black swan that is now on our boating lake, which I believe we're trying to get protection for because it is really super rare. Um, but it was just great to see the kids in that space because they come from a neighbouring um, estate called Ridge Hill. Levels of, you know, high levels of deprivation there. Um, really progressive school with a really kind of switched on teacher who's really kind of keen to get involved in things and it was really great to just bring them it's, it's literally a stone's throw from the school but bringing them into that space you know spreading the awareness of it that was that was a really positive thing because those kids are going to bring they'll drag the parents back at the weekend maybe go and look at the black swan or look for the wild thing which is not there anymore because it was a teacher in a costume but don't tell the kids that <laughs> but yeah that was that's kind of that's something really nice that's happening so that's the start of what we hope to be a bit of a 10-month program of story walks and it'd be lovely to see people come from out of area and see some of our beautiful green spaces as well. Sounds wonderful. Mm. It's only stones throw away from where some of those kids live. But mm-hmm. did you get a sense of how many of them previously accessed that space? Not directly from the, the children, but it's a space, it's it's sandwiched between the estate and it's uh, also next to uh, Tame Town of Glass by CFT, so our hospital effectively. And walking around there you can see that actually there's not that many families it's quite a newish space you do see dog walkers um you'll see the occasional runners we have a park run there of a weekend but generally you don't see that many kids there so i think it could be a sign of you know good things and the more events we put on there the more kind of we spread the news of it the more the families are going to know that it's there brilliant so that'd be a great indicator of change, seeing more and more mm-hmm. families in that space. Exactly. I'll have to hang around there for a bit, a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, just observing. Yeah, <laughs> doing your little counts and checking out. Oh, we'd love to hear. Mm-hmm. And what have you seen, Nicole? Any particular highlights for you in terms of the work in Tameside? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the story walk's a great example, but I think it's also it does work around like pavement games and that kind of thing. Um, Staley Bridge Hub as well, you know, some of the bike pods that you've done. There's been some community investment funds as well that you've done with Action Together in Tameside and I think this is a real kind of credit to you and your energy and there's just there's just a lot going on and a lot being tested and it's yeah it's just great to see so thank you One of the things that we're testing at the minute, which I'm, I'm quite excited about, so, I, so I'm the lead for the local pilot, but we um, brought in a lady called Marie, who is seated within kind of employment and skills. And through the work with TFGM and Mayor's Challenge Fund, we've managed to bag four bikes for free. So that's really nice because we're now working um, with employment and skills effectively to set up a little bit of a mini bike library so that um, one of her colleagues who works with young People who are trying to get into employment um, now potentially can borrow a bike to get to their interviews or to get to their first few months of work. So that feels like that work starting to build momentum now. Yeah, we, we always talk quite a lot within the pilot around that um, that leadership enabling kind of people to make their own decisions. And I think that's something that you do really well in Tameside and with the work that you've done with Marie and Hayley as well. And, you know, you've, you've created that space for them to try something different. And yeah, I think that's just a really, really good example of that. Hmm. I think it's one of the, the, the kind of principles, and I picked this up from somebody else, when I was at the um, LGA in Sport England, the residential course, mm-hmm. which is brilliant and everybody should go on it. But somebody was saying that the, the way they kind of like to go about it is to just um, inspire, connect and enable, which I think I've realised, reflecting kind of over the past few years of the, my main role, I think is to do that. 
more than anything else. Inspire, connect, and enable. Yes, ice. <laughs> there you yeah. go. She's very icy. Yeah, very yeah. icy. People love a good acronym there yeah. for uh, to capture. And just so again, people listening, because you referred to Marie in her role, you referred to Haley as well. So, mm-hmm. what's Haley's role in this? Oh, Haley's Haley's I've poached her from another area. <laughs> so it's a lot of this magpie coaching. Yeah. That sounds like that might be another tip. <laughs> um, Haley's just joined us on a twelve month um, a twelve month fixed term. I would love to make it longer, so just put a shout out there for you know if that's a possibility in the future. So when Hayley and I first connected, um, she worked in community safety um, and through various kind of mapping exercises, we started to see there's a lot of overlapping areas in terms of cycling and walking, antisocial behaviour, um, isolation, loneliness. So we, we kind of focused in on a very specific example, which was, so there's a block of flats in Staley Bridge and the planners in the Infinite Wisdom who designed them, or the architects rather than the planners, put a really big um, atrium on the outside of it, kind of Perspex Atrium, which is lovely if you want to kind of walk up your stairwell with your shopping and stay nice and dry, but it's also great for local young people who want to shelter somewhere. Um, So unfortunately, there was some antisocial behaviour going on where the atrium was being broken into and young people were sheltering, um, getting up to what young people do. And we started talking about, well, why? Why is this a a bad thing? And obviously for the residents of that flat, it's a bad thing, but actually if you remove the polarisation between kind of like young and old and you stop the demonisation of young people what we know is that these young people are just looking for what other people are yeah. they want to be warm they want to be dry they want to have social connectivity with their friends and unfortunately because there's not the provision of the space for them then they have to find a space by other means and that then becomes the antisocial behaviour which are then demonised for mm. so Haley and I um, just had some really open conversations and we kept kind of talking and mulling things over and thinking what could we do about this And again, from the LGA and Sport England course, it was the chief exec of Coventry. um, And his words always ring in my ears because he kept saying about, you know, of town centres or any spaces, well, whose space is this anyway? And I kept saying, you know, like, but why are they, whose space is this? Why are the town centres okay for older people, okay for people spending money, okay for people who want to come and do the shopping, but why is it not okay for young people to be there? And the main thing is always because, well, it's antisocial behaviour and people are worried or scared or concerned that there's going to be some damage. Well, actually, there's no provision for them there. So if we're not catering for them, it kind of stands to reason that not great stuff's going to happen. So Hayley and I started having a lot of um, kind of conversations about, like, where can we go with this? What makes sense? kind of going back to some conversations that I'd had a really, really long time previous, about seven years previous with our planners and some of our kind of town centre team about meanwhile usage of shop units. Um, we kind of reached a point where we found out that there was a shop unit that was sublet by one of our partners on the Active Alliance, so Jigsaw Homes. And we uh, worked together with them and Active Team decided to approach them to say, you've got an empty unit here. We could do something good with it. How about you kind of sign it over for kind of like peppercorn anyway we kind of passed that conversation on we passed the idea on and we connected some people together and then through some of those conversations the lease was sublet to active tame side who have now created a community hub in the center right next door to the flats where the problems were happening they're working with the edge of care team they're working with early intervention early early support and the idea is that they're going to bring those young people divert them away from where their presence is not necessarily a positive thing and they're going to bring them in and engage them in sport and physical activity, keep them off the streets, protect them from potential of kind of child sexual exploitation or being exposed to the wrong people. And, you know, and physical activity can be the hook that's part of that. So that was a really, really long-winded way of telling you who Hayley is. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Hayley's doing some great stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah Transformation. And I mean, that's certainly the reflection that I've seen and back to Nicole's point about the energy the change that you're creating is a lot around kind of yeah, more child friendly spaces streets mm-hmm. places mm-hmm. Um, and how you design that in literally to the fabric of our, our environments mm-hmm. which is just so critical it's, it's needed isn't it so there's a lot of learning mm-hmm. and I'm sure there's people listening now that will be keen to pick up the phone and go great that sounds fab <laughs> how do we do a bit more of that before we move on to the challenges is there anything else you'd want to add in terms of what have been kind of the key enablers in all the work or what's really helped things to to progress and move forward? Um, I think the key enablers are just other people who are willing to have a conversation and willing to just see where it kind of goes. People that will give you the time to 
for, for you to kind of chip away at them a little bit, I suppose. And also kind of finding like-minded people across the organisation. So um, we have another, what we see as a real positive is we kind of built a relationship with uh, the architects and the people that are doing town centre regeneration. And they kind of came to us and said, there's there's a space, there's a disused car park, it's part of a regeneration space, what can we do with it? And I said, well, a pop-up park would be really nice. Could we maybe think about that? So we managed to connect them in with um, members of the like local community, again, deprived area, St Peter's Ward um, in Ashton. And they worked together with the community and now we have a pop-up park. I've, I've not been to see it yet. I'm really excited. I need to get there and see it. But that, that's just a real positive. But that came about because the person that is now the new person that does kind of town centre regen was like, why not? Why can't we do that? And again, kind of like, whose space is it anyway? Who could we bring into it? So having somebody that's kind of a bit progressive and easy to chat to opens a lot of doors I think uh, to be honest I think Annette is a, a real key asset in Tameside and I think just your openness and your ability to, to build relationships with people is just a, is, is you know is, is really important um, and I think you know we've, we've kind of joked about the, the fact that you need reassurance but I also feel like you, you kind of you trust people and you, you, you've you got that trust and that passion um, that really drives you in this work and you know I've seen it first hand you get the you get you get palmed off the the kind of craziest inquiries that kind of come through the council <laughs> and yet you're always kind of looking at it with a, a really open mind and you, you you know you've got a real attitude around you know okay well how can we make this happen rather than just you know being like um it's not really my job but you know it's mm. You know, you really want to do the best for the people in Tameside as well, and that really does shine through. And we've talked, haven't we, about the importance of having that kind of strategic leadership, but you clearly provide to provide, enable them the kind of collective distributed leadership. Um, and then at a more senior level, having Stephen Pleasant as a chief exec, who's obviously been our chair for GM Moving since the very beginning and a big advocate for physical activity, for place based approaches, the whole system mm-hmm. working. Um, has that made a difference? What kind of role has he played in this? Um, I think it kind of not made a difference. I think I've been really lucky in that respect because he's kind of paved the way and opened doors in spaces and forums that I'm not present in. So I don't know all the ways that he's done it, but I'm pretty sure that the fact that he's always been really behind it has meant that people have been more willing to talk to me when I come up with some random idea. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be half an hour to chat about something really bizarre um so i know that that's made a difference and i know also that um in terms of the active workplace work that we've been doing so marie is kind of the outward focusing active workplace person and i've been inward focused and i've been i've been allowed to run with a program about managers supporting movement um which has been i think i'm on my fourth session now so the fact that I've been let loose on other members of staff <laughs> feels really positive. And I think without the backing of Stephen and, you know, his senior leadership team, to, especially in kind of HR and organisational development, to let me do that, I, I don't think that would have happened. So now it's, it's a big, a big nut to crack, I think, in terms of the active workplace, in terms of organisational culture. But I think, I think that's definitely opened a door that probably for other people might still be closed. So, challenges. We talk about being open and honest and about learning from what doesn't work, what's hard. Um, so, for one, what have been the key challenges you've seen so far? Oh, one that niggle that I always bang on about is how to spend small amounts of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, re- it's really tricky. Like, I think as a local authority, we're really good at kind of commissioning large programmes of work, you know, like multi-million pound Contracts, but actually, if I want to spend twenty pounds on some vouchers for some cups of tea for people, my word, that's really hard. So we found workarounds. Um, the workarounds have been revoked. <laughs> I'm trying to find another workaround that I need to think about today, but that's a niggle that we just don't seem to be able to get past. But I, it's kind of, it's kind of small fry. Um, the main thing that I think is difficult is that you can start all these conversations up with people across the system and they can theoretically speak and agree with you that, yeah, absolutely, we could join up about this. It's a shared agenda. Definitely, we want to do something. But then when push comes to shove and you say, right, OK, well, who can I, whose name can I put on this piece of work? Everybody kind of suddenly disappears back down the rabbit warren. And that's difficult because we are asking people to, in systemic work, effectively do work that's not 
in their job description because it's you know it's not part of their work program necessarily so I think resource is difficult and it's a bit of a catch-22 because the people that we're talking to right now are the right people in the system for that work to sit with but it's not their job we could recruit somebody and make it their job but they then by their very nature would not be the right person placed in the system because they'd be sitting with us Mm -hmm. so it's really tricky without freeing up capacity in the existing system for people to take on this as part of their role it kind of can't happen mm. so yeah if you can fix that you know, just, <laughs> yeah. yeah that'd be really good thanks that's come up a few times mm. that piece about people that having the freedom and the space and a sense of permission to mm. do the job that needs to be done not to do the job that necessarily under job description and there's more examples of that I think across kind of workforce mm. as a whole really mm. and in terms of people being able to have greater freedom to do things that they care about and are passionate about but mm. um, particularly when resources are tight and particularly mm-hmm. when there's a sense of nervousness and risk and the mm-hmm. system's under stress which it it has been for a long time but particularly the last mm-hmm. few years it's harder isn't it I think for people to feel that they can necessarily do what they think is the right thing if it isn't also clearly within their list of key targets that doesn't answer your question I'm that doesn't solve it for you <laughs> it just acknowledges it that that's fairly normal but there's also yeah. signs of change yeah, I think it is. It's, it's right. It's the permissions thing. So one particular example is somebody from another area directorate. They were put in touch with me because they had a great idea, and I was like, "Yep, yeah, that totally fits with what we're trying to do. That'd be really great." And we managed to kind of move things around, and eventually we got um, basically a project with some support. And it was like, "Well, we can hand this to you. You can do that. Fantastic. That was your great idea. We've had a conversation. Now there's some resource around it. Let's do it." And that individual was like really keen, really wanted to do it. But actually, because it didn't fit with their job description, there were not the permissions coming through. So to my knowledge, it's kind of stopped, Mm -hmm. which is a real shame because that particular person was really passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And it did fit with their kind of work area, but just because it wasn't written on a plan somewhere to say this is your job. When push came to shove, it was like, well, that's the first thing you're going to have to drop. Are you finding it getting, does it get easier in terms of people being able to articulate how this contributes to their agenda and how it might not be on their job description but actually if they do this if they support enable more people to be active Mm -hmm. that will help them achieve the outcomes that they're being measured against is that getting any easier i think it would probably be easier if we without covid i mean everything obviously would have been easy without covid but i think (laughs) um, one of the main things was where we would have been influencing the space is perhaps um the not the you know really senior management level but the the sandwich in between of kind of like our middle management layer if we'd have not had covid taking up all of the headspace and time um then those forums would have been more available for us to start chipping away at that they've not been available to us so um some of the things that i'd really like to get into that space and talk about to start shifting at that level so that it enables more people kind of you know further towards the front line hopefully that's going to start opening up again so hopefully I can you know worm my way into those spaces and start having those conversations but it's not there yet and I guess so during Covid one thing we saw was actually some of those governance and processes and things are getting in the way of spending 20 quid (laughs) sometimes Mm -hmm. some of those things shifted Mm -hmm. in that moment because there was a real clear sense that there was an urgent job to be done and it was everyone's job to achieve that whatever your job description Mm -hmm. told you um, and that helped to you know galvanise the system and help some of those changes happen. And in Tameside in particular, in terms of your approach that was taken around leisure services, mm. um, there was a real shift. I don't know if you want to just share any of that as an example of, of what you did differently in Tameside. In terms of the leisure services, I mean, I'm probably not the best person to ask on that front, but what I would probably would do is link it back to um, our Play Streets um, agenda, which is effectively trying to get hyper-local play opportunities on street, get kids out onto the street, you know, prioritising kids over cars kind of thing, um, which the, the changes in the kind of legislation meant that we had a gateway open so that we could do those because there was a focus on, you know, people that were quarantined or isolated in, you know, high-rise flats or, or small houses or, you know, kind of overcrowded and deprived areas. So we were able to get people out onto the street more. But what Active Tameside did was also took that out to older people. So we had an active streets approach where we brought older people out and they did, you know, Tai Chi 
in the front garden, socially distanced. So that kind of community-based delivery, building on the freedoms that changes in legislation gave us to get out and do play streets yeah. was a real positive. Um, when that was kind of revoked, we then found ourselves, well, we want to run a play street. It was like, well, actually, we don't have that gateway in the same way anymore. So that it was a step backwards, effectively. Um, and that's something we need to work on. Hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so some steps forward and then some steps back Mm -hmm. um anything so in terms of co-benefits of what you've seen so far so all the things that we know flow from people moving more anything in particular that you'd want to point to anything that's maybe been surprising or that stood out when you say co-benefits what specifically do you mean yeah good question so we talk about whether it's the physical or mental health benefits whether it's the environmental benefits whether it's about um social and economic inclusion um whether it's around yeah building people's relationships and their own kind of individual development or community development you know it's a whole host aren't there of benefits that we see all flow from people moving more and more of the time um, and all of those, I guess, happen, but it's was whether there's anything in particular for you that you've seen has flowed from any of this work that stood out, or is it a bit of everything? Um, I think that's quite a difficult one to answer. Um, I'd say um, the Pavement Games is a really good example of that. So I know, Annette, you've, you've worked quite hard on that in terms of previously attempts by schools to, you know, like what do you call them like uh, traffic wardens with the the pupils yeah yeah and you know i know you so know, junior pcso's yeah, yeah junior pcso's and i know from your kind of perspective you didn't think that it was you know in terms of that whole system approach it, it you know perhaps wasn't the, the best way to go about things so you know you've worked quite closely with those pupils and schools and to think of creative ways to to uh, for children to actively travel to school and you know while it's great that children are being more physically active and enjoying that that process of going to school but there's also so many different kind of you know additional add-ons to that so the pollution around the schools and you know it's it's stopping you know some of the the kind of um issues around that traffic management around the schools and the the you know the issues with, with people you know parking all over the place and the danger of people who do want to walk and things like that so yeah i think that's 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 a you know decent example of those kind of wider wider outcomes as well so yeah I think probably linked to that I mean this is probably maybe it's a bit too specific for the question that you asked but I'll say it anyway you could edit it out it's wrong so one of the, one of the things that's been really nice so with, with that same school we've done um, duck walks mm. <laughs> there's a great one in the um, in the press release all hands on duck <laughs> I love it um, I didn't think of it I can't take credit for that um that what's been really nice about that is that was a project that kind of with a few introductions organically grew and now we've got a kind of solid little cohort of people that are with a really vested interest that so we've got um the friends of sunnybank vale we've got a uh, greenside primary school their PE lead we've got junior health visitors we've got uh, manchester and district orienteering volunteers um i'll left somebody out there and that's going to be horrendous um, <laughs> really great bunch of people anyway so the fact that we've kind of got it was it was formerly a landfill site which has been greened up and now it's like an award winning um you know haven for wildlife and stuff and we've got duck trails that the kids have designed so that's the kind of the co-design they came up with like there's like octo duck and things like that and spider duck (laughs) they're really cool they're really good fun but we've now got um, a link tree page where we can bring in green space information about flora and fauna we've got orienteering activities i'm saying this like it's happened it's about to happen um and and we can on that we can go well here's your volunteering opportunity for um the friends of here's an opportunity to come on a list pick here's a social thing so it's it's a really nice way that it's kind of come together and i feel like i can kind of step out of that circle now and that relationship is kind of galvanized and i think they're going to go on to do kind of really good things so it's the co-benefits are that we've got a great local resource that's been co-designed by people but that relationship that's left in place now between the kind of the the several different parties is is going to leave a bit of a legacy so what i'd like to do in the next kind of 12 months is step away from things and leave some legacies in place and then start looking into new areas because it does feel like for a long time, I've been focusing on the same networks and same partners, and I feel like I want to explore somewhere new now. But as you said, they're now solid, aren't they? And people mm. are looking to Greenside a lot in terms of a lot of the work they've done and how they've navigated that, and you know, changes that people want to make across Greater Manchester. So mm. sometimes it takes time, and then from that, it can grow and spread. 
so on that basis what what does the future look like um so I did another course the other day I can't remember which one it was but it was about how you're going to move things forward and I think I think a lot of that is to try and figure out from things that we've tested and learned like how we do you know move into business as usual with the ones that we're kind of happy with so I know this week we've been speaking with children's centres and the, from the previous kind of story walk pilot we did when I got back in touch to say let's kind of pick that up again they were like well we're already doing some anyway we're doing our own which was lovely because and now what we're doing with this is going to complement it so we've we've got quite quite a decent program of that coming which is a combination of you know ones with a storyteller ones where the guys are kind of doing it by themselves and we've got the legacy of the self-led walks that we had over kind of covid so what would be really nice if i can kind of go for myself right well that's 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 embedded now they they get it they want it they're going to carry on with it whether i'm there or not and to you know drift away and go, <laughs> go and find some, something else, else. <laughs> exactly exactly you know like some more conversations in different places so I know, you know, working with the music service, we had some conversations a long time ago um, and they got kind of parked up. I'd really like to revisit some of those. Yeah. So it'd just be nice to start picking up some of the other threads mm. and seeing where they take us. I've seen that in other areas, actually. That there's, there's, I think now things with COVID have kind of quieted down a little bit. The kind of cultural element is starting to come back into the works. Mm. I feel like during covid and, and this last kind of six month period it's been it has you know focused around kind of that physical activity and, and getting people moving but i feel like there is definite space for those cultural opportunities as well um it's something that we've spoken about definitely in rochdale quite a lot and yeah yeah i'm interested to see kind of how you progress with that mm. me too <laughs> Me too. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, maybe we can have another podcast in the future and hear how things have continued to spread and grow and how many more ducks we've got Mm. across Tameside. Well, thank you. It's been, yeah, it's been a real joy and I continue to be inspired by, um, yeah, all the work you're doing. It's fantastic. So, um, yeah, continue and may the force be with you. (laughs) And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation just as much as I did. We've heard how moving matters to everyone and how we can all play a role to design moving back into everyday life. We'd love to now hear how you keep moving and the ways you are supporting others to live an active life. You can contact us on our socials on Facebook and Twitter. Just search Greater Sport and don't forget the hashtag GMMovingInAction. Please do share this episode with people and organisations who will find it useful. And join the movement, the movement. A big thank you to everyone who's investing in this work and playing their parts to test, to learn and to make this happen. This series is a Mike Media production.